Hello and welcome to the second part of my video about this exciting Data Expert EXP4349 mainboard. In the last part I made some fixes, resoldered the VLB slot, replaced broken memory slots and added missing parts which were required to run a 386 CPU in this 486 mainboard. The first tests were successful and today I would like to share with you my experience and talk about the issues which I found. Actually, the first issue was spotted by a mindful viewer, the Falschpieler. He noticed that the manufacturer recommends to use an AMD 486 CPU for the best experience. This is not expert at all, if you ask me, and has to be instantly fixed. Here, much better. Another thing which I would like to mention is the bad layout of the AT power connector. It has no gap between the connector and the memory slots. Usually a T-plug has such clips which hold it in place by hooking under the power connector. So on this board it was not possible to push the plug completely into the connector. It worked halfway and was enough to power up the system, but it didn't sit tightly enough. So I had to cut down the side clips on the plug a little bit. That was annoying and unfortunately by far not the last flaw in the design of this board. After the last video I made a lot of tests, benchmarks and gaming. During my initial tests I experienced a very unstable mainboard. In the first place I was interested in running a 386DX in combination with VLB graphics card and compare it to results with ISA graphics card. First issue which I stumbled upon were that 33 MHz CPU clock. I doubled and triple checked all the jumpers, played around with various clock settings but all what was possible are 20, 25 and 33 MHz, despite that the documentation mentions 40 MHz explicitly. For testing I switched to a 486DX40 CPU and that actually did work at specified clock. So what's the difference between a 386 and a 486 CPU in regards of clock? Well, a 486 is directly supplied with external clock, which also defines the frontside bus. For example, a 486DX25 is clocked with 25 MHz, a DX33 and DX40 are clocked with 33 and 40 MHz respectively. The 486DX2 CPUs double the applied clock internally and DX4 CPUs triple it. So, for example, 486DX33 um, 486DX266 and 486DX4100 all work with 33 MHz external clock and multiply it internally with 1, 2 or 3. The 386 CPUs on the other hand require doubled external clock to work properly, because internally those need two clocks for every effective CPU clock. In the documentation it is called periods and each uh, effective CPU clock contains two periods. With other words, a 386DX25 needs 50 MHz clock, a 386DX33 and DX40 need then 66 or 80 MHz respectively. So this board needs to supply different clocks for 386 and 486 CPUs, even if they both are actually 40 MHz for example. In such case a 486 would need 40 MHz clock, but a 386 would require 80 MHz clock to run at 40 MHz effectively. The interesting question is how CPU clock is provided on this board. And here comes again something unusual about it. Usually on all the models there were such clock oscillators, which delivered predefined clock to the board. So when changing or overclocking the CPU you also needed to change this oscillator to get another clock. I already made a video about 386SX overclocking where I exchanged such an oscillator. In later boards, variable clock generator ICs were used where required clock could be set by setting the jumpers accordingly. Basically this solution is more or less what is still used until today, except that physical jumpers were replaced by software settings in BIOS or EFI, but the principle is the same. Now if we try to find a dedicated clock generator IC on this board, we will not find any. Here are the jumpers which are responsible for the clock selection and they are going through a latch directly into the chipset. On the other side the generated clock is going out of the chipset, goes to this jumper where on the left pin we have the clock as we need it for a 486 and on the right one the double clock as required for a 386. 
The middle pin is then connected to the related pins on the CPUs. So this jumper needs to be set dependent on the CPU which we are going to use. And if we look at the marking um, on the chipset, we will find that the model number is ALI M1429G. Unfortunately, I didn't find the datasheet, but by looking through the images of another mainboard with this chipset, I found that the most of them are using M1429 variant without G. All those boards have dedicated clock generators, so I think that G stands for Integrated Clock Generator. I measured the outputs and it looks like this chipset is able to generate up to 66 MHz, but if set to 80 MHz, it fails and doesn't output any clock at all. This could be something BIOS related, since that one does set up the chipset on boot and maybe some bits are missing. Unfortunately, the one BIOS dump which was in the RetroApp database doesn't work in my board at all and freezes the system shortly before booting the operation system. However, it also doesn't seem to change the clock generation behavior. I uploaded the BIOS dump from my board as well, in case someone needs that. I also looked through many other similar boards in the database and tried other BIOS dumps, but all of them didn't work at all. Well, at least it's now more or less clear why the 3T6DX didn't want to work at 40 MHz in this board. But is it possible to fix that? Yes, I'd need to find the datasheet of the chipset to tell if that one can be convinced to generate 80 MHz clock. But if that doesn't help, then it is also possible to add an own external clock generator. Um, as you see, there is a place for a clock oscillator which can be probably used to attach a clock generator IC. However, I will leave that option for another day. For my tests, 33 MHz should be sufficient since for now I am more interested in relative VLB performance than the CPU itself. For the tests I used this Tsang Labs ET4000 Diamond Speedstar, the fastest ISO graphics card which I have and which was donated by Chris. Thank you very much once again. And for VLB I used this Cyrus Logic, a quite common card with very good compatibility and performance. I used the very same cards for the benchmarks in my December 2022 video. If you saw my last video, maybe you remember the first numbers in SysInfo which I showed. With the 3D6DX33 I got 26.9 points, which were far below 35.9 reference mentioned below. On the 486DX266 I got a similar deviation. As I mentioned last time, the amount of options in the BIOS on this board is mind-blowing, so I started to change some settings to get to a reference value. Setting memory speed to fast didn't change anything, at least in SysInfo benchmark, but after I reduced the cache read timing from 1 to 0 wait states, the performance in SysInfo went up even higher than the reference value to 36.1. That was a good value so far, however the system became very unstable. I couldn't finish any tests whatsoever. 3D Bench, Doom and even Landmark tests crashed after some seconds. I played with the BIOS settings once again, tried more conservative settings for the memory, but nothing helped. As soon as I set the cache read wait states back to 1, the system became stable again, but much slower than it should be. So I decided to try faster SRAM ICs. The pre-installed chips were 20 nanoseconds and I had some 15 nanoseconds chips in my spares box, so I installed them. Unfortunately I had no 8 equal ICs, so I had to use 4x32K UMC and 4x32K ISSI, all 15 nanoseconds and no one is working. It's not good to mix the ICs, but it should be ok to see if something changes. And that didn't change anything, but as I replaced the SRAM ICs, I noticed something what I previously overlooked somehow. This damaged resistor array. It should contain 10k resistors, and as I checked the resistance values on the first resistor I got 10k, on the second and on the third they were already over 100k, on the following resistors I measured something in range of mega ohm. Uh, measuring resistors in circuit is not precise, but if you have multiple resistors in parallel, the overall resistance value would decrease and not raise. So if you measure 100k on a 10k resistor, 
it is probably dead. Also as a hint, such an array of pull up, down resistors or bus terminators should have nearly the same resistance on all data lines. If you measure different values, there is something fishy on the bus. As I often say, add fresh solder to make your life easier when desoldering old components. Wiggle the pins and repeat the procedure for every pin, which is not loose. Never try to pull on the components with a lot of force, or you will damage the PCB. Yeah, and as you see, as I removed the resistor array, my confidence that it is dead rose instantly. I don't think that it is necessary to make further measurement on this one. I didn't have a new replacement resistor array at hand, but I could extract one from scrap. It is yellow and not black like the other one, but it is uh, pretty much the same 10k part. When soldering such resistor arrays, um, it is important to keep the orientation in mind. The first pin of the part is marked with a dot. This dot has to be aligned with the first hole on the PCB, which is marked with a square on this board. Sometimes you find a one or small arrow, but all the same, it's important that the first pin goes into the first hole. As you see, now all the data lines on the bus are terminated with 10k. And after I fixed that, the board became much more stable. I could finalize many tests with conservative um, BIOS settings, but unfortunately every try uh, to tweak something in BIOS ended up in spontaneous reboots and freezes. I tried different RAM and cache chips switched back to the original cache ICs, but nothing really helped. Also the crashes were quite hard to predict. Sometimes the system ran 20 minutes without a problem, sometimes it even refused to boot. Accidentally I did the screen capture in another room, where I used a different PSU and there I noticed that the system worked maybe slightly more stable than on the workbench. And this brought me to an idea that there might be a power issue. So I connected my oscilloscope to a 5 volts pin near the CPU and I got around 300 millivolts voltage ripple. This is actually quite a lot and could app up in heavy instability of the hardware, especially if there are even higher peaks from time to time. A value below 100 millivolts would be something more appropriate and to keep that value as low as possible, there should be some decoupling capacitors um, on the board between 5 volts and ground to filter high frequency ripple. And this board has some tantalum capacitors indeed. I desoldered some of them and they seem to be well in specs. So I decided to add more caps as near to the CPU as possible to get the ripple down. On the board near the CPU there is a place which asks for a capacitor. One hole is connected to 5 volts, the other one is ground just as needed. It is quite narrow, so I needed a capacitor with lower diameter and relatively high capacitance. Luckily I had some 1000 microfarads uh, electrolytic caps at hand which passed uh, perfectly into the gap. This capacitor halved the ripple down to about 150 millivolts. Unfortunately, I didn't record uh, the measurement, but that was still a bit too high. The bigger electrolytic capacitor is not able to filter even higher frequencies and for that a smaller ceramic capacitor in parallel can be used. So I soldered a 0.1 microfarad ceramic capacitor between the legs of the electrolytic cap. That brought the voltage ripple down to around 50 millivolts, a very good value. And what shall I say, the system became rock solid. Hours of testing and experimenting I had not one crash. Even with highly tweaked BIOS settings and overclocked ISA bus, the system stayed absolutely stable. Now, where the board was running reliably, it was time to look at the benchmark results. My first goal was to check out if 3T6DX can benefit from the VLB slot. 
Most of the advanced settings didn't make a huge difference, usually improvements under 1-2%. to 2 However, uh, system timing settings were very interesting. First of all, the auto configuration has to be turned off on this mainboard, or it will ignore all the settings below. And auto configuration is conservative and super slow. SRAM means basically cache. Read has to be set to zero weight states and write to zero weight states. DRAM, read write as well as cache cycle check has to be fast. These are the settings with non-overclocked ISO bus, which would give the most boost to this board. As I already mentioned, with the settings I could bring the 36DX33 from 26.9 to 36.1 points in season 4. This was more than the reference value and a good starting point to overclock the ISA bus. In the BIOS of this mainboard, the ISA bus clock can be set in the advanced system setup, system timing. AT clock can be set to 7.19 MHz, which is the default settings, or set to clock 2 divider. Clock 2 is the doubled CPU clock, which I mentioned before, and at 33 MHz means 66 MHz. For example, setting clock 2 divided by 6 with clock 2 at 66 MHz would mean ISO bus at 11 MHz, clock 2 divided by 5 would be 13 MHz, and clock 2 divided by 4 16 MHz. I don't know what polling clock means, to be honest. Um, it can be also set dependent on the clock too, but I couldn't measure any difference, no matter what I set. I have no ISA card which um, would show me the clock, but I measured it using my oscilloscope to be sure that the um, in BIOS selected clock is really delivered to the ISA bus. With the 386DX33, I could overclock the ISA bus up to 13 MHz. It was able to post with 16 MHz. But the system couldn't boot reliably, even with more conservative memory settings in the BIOS, 15 nanoseconds cache and 16 nanoseconds RAM. By the way, greetings to Robert at this point. With the ISA bus running at stock clock at 7.19 MHz, I got 3437 characters per second in landmark speed test. With VLB, this number went up to 10802. That's almost 300%. A very promising result, but this is a synthetic benchmark. It would be much more interesting to see the difference in demanding games of the time. I answered already in my December 2022 the question if Doom was enjoyable on a 386DX and with heavily overclocked ISA VGA card. With this window size, with the bar on the bottom, I got back then very humble results, slightly above 8 FPS. Of course, I repeated the same tests on this mainboard and got 5.9 FPS, 6.3 FPS and 6.6 .6 FPS at ISA clock speeds 7. 0.19 MHz, 11 MHz and 13 MHz respectively. As I said, unfortunately on this board I was not able to get the ISA bus reliably to 16 MHz with a 386 CPU, but more about it later. To remind you, these are the results with a 33 MHz 386DX, which is about 21% slower than the 40 MHz at which I made my December 2022 measurements. There, the ISA bus was also overclocked to 16 MHz, so the whole system was about 25% faster, which corresponds to the numbers I measured on this board. So, I made the same tests with the VLB graphics card and got 7.2 FPS, full stop. Overclocking ISA didn't change anything, of course, because that doesn't affect VLB. I tried it just for protocol, but there was no difference whatsoever. So, does a 386DX benefit from VLB? Yes, it does. Let's forget about overclocking for a second and compare the hardware at its stock clocks. 5.9 FPS on ISA against 7.2 FPS on VLB. That's an increase by over 22%, but does it bring the missing performance which would be needed to play Doom on 386? Definitely not. Even if I interpolate these results from 33 to 40 MHz, I would get around 9 FPS. This is still not enough to enjoy a first person shooter, so once again with this window size, Doom is not enjoyable on any 386, even 
on an absolute monster machine with a VLB graphics card. Only with reduced window size it would be possibly to get near 15 FPS, but I guess everybody has to decide on his own if this can be considered enjoyable. By the way, in my December 2022 there were a couple of questions regarding the math core processor and if it can make Doom to run faster. So all results you see in this video were made with a math core processor and as you see it makes no difference whatsoever. Doom simply didn't use floating point arithmetics and so math core processor was not used or useful in that game. Well, as you see, VLB didn't bring any magic source, which would make the 3T6 twice as fast. It definitely brought quite a measurable performance boost in some applications and especially in Windows more than in DOS games like Doom, but as a VLB was introduced to the market, 3T6 was already a dead end and a VLB graphics card couldn't change much about it. I made some other tests and benchmarks, tried to tweak the bias even further, but that all didn't bring much and I came up with similar results as Peter aka CPU Galaxy. He made also a video about VLB on a 3T6 long time ago and his results were pretty much identical. If you are interested in details, please watch his video about it, where he gives some more numbers to look at. I totally agree with his results and it doesn't make a lot of sense to duplicate them here. But this is not the end of the story. Peter contacted me after my December 2022 video and asked if I want to participate on his ISA Doom 25 FPS challenge. The point is that it is very hard to get over the magical 25 FPS mark on a system with an ISA graphics card, even with a faster CPU. The conditions of the challenge are the system has to be more or less period correct, Perfect system would be a 486 on a pure ISA mainboard, but VLB boards are also ok, in case VLB itself is not used for the challenge. Doom has to run in almost full screen, reduced just by the bar on the bottom. As I started to benchmark this board with a 486DX266, I was impressed by the numbers. 69 megabytes per second throughput on level 1 cache and 29 megabytes per second on memory was really not bad at all. And with this setup it was possible to overclock the ISA bus to 16 megahertz. This was the smallest divider possible in the BIOS. Clock 2 by 4 or 66 divided by 4 as I explained it previously. The system ran rock solid and delivered 3230 points or 23 FPS. Remember, the ISA bus had to be overclocked by 200% from 8 to 16 MHz to reach this. That was really impressive, so I inserted the 80 MHz version of the 486DX2, which runs with frontside bus of 40 MHz instead of 33. I also slowed down the memory refresh rate, which got even slightly more out of the system. With 40 MHz frontside bus and ISA clock divider 4, the ISA bus speed was now at 20 MHz, but the system remained stable. In Doom the video card started to show artifacts, um, probably because the video memory was too slow. On the card there are 70 nanoseconds memory chips. I guess uh, if I replace them with 60 nanoseconds the artifacts will disappear, but it's not important for the tests I guess. I made this run a couple of times and the system remained stable. Two thousand eight hundred and fifty points, or with other words, twenty six point two FPS. To be honest, I was blown away by this result. There was a lot of tweaking and overclocking involved, but here we are. It is absolutely possible to get over twenty five FPS in Doom with an ISA graphics card. The interesting part is that I tried five other mainboards in my collection with Via, Sys, uh, Opti, and UMC chipsets. And they all were not nearly able to reach the numbers which I got on this ALI chipset based mainboard. Usually it is a common opinion that the 486 ALI chipsets were slower compared to the competitors. And this was what I thought as well. This is obviously not the case and with a proper BIOS and some tweaks this can be a very fast hardware. 
The best thing is that I believe that it is possible to get even more out of this. However, this video is already long enough, so join me in the next part where I want to make another upgrade to this board and see if we can push the results even further. So far, I hope you enjoyed this video, please let me know what you think about it, and for now, thank you and goodbye.